On this episode of Women Behind Bars, one woman pled guilty to the murder of a local prostitute. It was a torture killing. She was bound, she was gagged, she was stomped, kicked. She finally was strangled to death. They took my best friend from me. So that's a real big hole that I'm trying to like close up. Damien Prophet controlled his woman primarily through fear. Then Shaniqua Brown tells her story. She was allegedly involved in a robbery that ended in the murder of a Chinese food delivery man. I saw the food, I saw the menu, I saw puddles and puddles of blood, I saw footprints of blood, and then I saw him. The victim only carries chains for 20. So how much money was really netted and what is a human life worth? One phone call can turn tragically wrong in a split second. Two women, two brutal crimes. These are the stories of Dolly Mae Clapp and Shaniqua Brown. On January 6, 2006, in a vacant lot on the east side of Buffalo, New York, police found the body of 35-year-old Michelle Hicks. She was beaten pretty badly. Her eyes were swollen shut. She was not only being physically beaten, punched, and kicked, she was being tortured with the use of these chemicals. Detectives learned that Michelle was a prostitute working for a pimp named Harold Bonner and a 47-year-old woman who they say was his second in command, Dolly Mae Clapp. Harold Bonner and Dolly were evil people. Clapp insists she knew nothing about the prostitution ring. She consistently kept saying she was a property manager. And she denied helping Bonner commit murder. I didn't kill that girl. That girl was alive when I left. But police believed otherwise. She was there during the whole murder. I think Dolly Mae Clapp demonstrated herself to be a pathological liar and a sadist. Was Dolly Mae Clapp falsely accused? Or was she a willing partner in a sadistic torture killing? Dolly Mae Clapp was the only girl of four children, born to Catherine and Luther Clapp. I was born in Lackawanna. Um, it's a little town outside of Buffalo. My father passed away when I was small. It was a really, really big loss. After her father's death, Dolly and her three brothers were put in foster care for several years. I don't even know why they took us from my mother. I didn't hate her. Um, she came to visit us when we was in a foster home. My sister Dolly, she took care of me when I was younger. She uh, cooked for me, made sure I stayed out of trouble. When Dolly was 12, she went back to live with her mother. I think I had a good childhood. Even when I came home with my mother, she's always been there for me. I took her through some rough times where I used to run away from home, stay out all night. Dolly's mom enrolled her in a strict boarding school for troubled girls. It was run by nuns, but they were really, really nice. You had to work your way up to privileges, and that's what I did. The young teen finished high school a year early, but struggled to find a career she could stick with. I wanted to run the streets to just a party and have a good time. That's why I never completed anything. I went to just about every college I could think of. I went to tailoring school, I went to cosmetology school. At age 27, Dolly had her first child and decided to raise him as a single mom. She then gave birth to three more children with a close friend over the next five years. We had a good friendship, um, but we wasn't like boyfriend and girlfriend. As she raised her children, Dolly began to experiment with drugs. I was smoking crack. When you first start, you know, you think you have a handle on it. You do it on the weekends, but it's becoming more addictive, and you're not aware of it. When my sister Dolly was uh, going through her drug addiction, that was a negative part of her life, and it affected her kids and her household. I had my kids taken from me. Dolly's children went to live with their paternal grandmother, who tried to help Dolly. She was good to her kids, the best she knew how to be, be due to drugs. It changed Dolly. I know that Dolly can do better. In an effort to get her kids back, Dolly stayed clean for a year, but then relapsed. It was awful. I mean, I wish I had more control. But it's, it's hard. It's really, 
it's really, really hard to stop smoking crack. I wasted a lot of time getting high. I could have spent with my kids. The time is gone, you can't get it back. Dolly says she met 47-year-old Harold Bonner in 2000. Bonner was also known on the streets as Damien Prophet. Damien Prophet was a pimp, sort of an old school pimp on the east side of Buffalo. Um, he ran prostitutes, he owned a number of properties as well. When I first met him, he was nice. He was talking about his houses and they were empty. He was trying to get them rented out and buy a little money. And he needed it and I gave it to him. Dolly is a good person. If you needed something, she'd help you with it. He was telling me we're going to be together, and I, I believed him. He was a good guy. At least I, I thought he was. Bonner would, would pass himself off as a church-going man in Buffalo. I think he fancied himself more of a businessman who tried to stay below the radar of, uh, of the police in Buffalo. Dolly says she and Bonner had a romantic relationship as well as a business partnership in managing Bonner's properties. He was paying all my bills, you know, he was taking care of me. He knew I got high, he knew I used drugs. He didn't treat her right. And he would buy drugs for her to keep her high. He is a dog, was a dog, and always gonna be one. People was telling me that he used to be a pimp. He said, I'm going back to pimping. I didn't believe him. Harold Bonnard obviously had delusions of grandeur. He could convince people, especially the women he dealt with, he preyed on the most desperate women. A lot of women who didn't have family, didn't have friends, didn't have a life. He would control them because they had nothing else in their life. Dolly denies knowing that Bonner was pimping women at the time. He started doing it behind my back. And they said that I knew about what he was doing. No, I didn't. But authorities contend she played a key role in his prostitution ring. Dolly May Clapp was very important to his business. She managed uh, his rental property, she collected rent for him, and she managed his human property, which in his mind were these women who prostituted for him. Honestly, I only knew of four, but as I later found out, it was a lot more. One of the women who worked for Bonner as a prostitute was Michelle Hicks. She was beautiful. Not just on the outside, but the inside. She had a hard life, and she didn't let that stop her. She was hooked on drugs for a while, and there came a time when she got away from that, and she actually attended rehab sessions. Michelle was like a, um, a second sister to me. We were in a 12-step program together. Um, she had a lot of clean time, and I don't know what happened. She began to use again. Michelle's friends noticed that she lost a lot of weight as a prostitute for Harold Bonner, AKA Damien Prophet. When she got back on the street, I think she wasn't eating right. Um, she didn't look good at all. Uh, Damien Prophet controlled his women primarily through fear. He not only would abuse them physically and psychologically, um, he was also abusing them in front of his other prostitutes to send a message to them that they needed to stay in line as well and obey him. The girls were completely afraid of him. He, you know, ruled by terror, food deprivation, sleep deprivation, um, you know, narcotics being provided to them to keep them uh, numb mentally and emotionally. He was brutal. He was known to punch and kick and beat girls. He'd have bars on the windows. He'd keep dogs in the front and back hallway so they couldn't escape or get out. I heard evidence of stun gun use by him in the past. He had a lot of ways of controlling those girls. I've never seen him beat those women. Whatever they asked for, he gave it to them. I think a lot of girls, they was using him to get high. These are girls that didn't have anywhere to go, so here he come along, Mr. I'm going to take care of you and support your drug habit. Um, from what I've seen, they just, like, used him. According to court testimony, Bonner often used Dolly to help him control the other women. When he had problems with the girls, she did some of the intimidation for him. She was referred to by Damien Prophet as the exterminator. He would uh, tell them that he had to call the exterminator now uh, in, in an effort to threaten them. And uh, she would talk to them on the phone and uh, ask them what they had done wrong and uh, try to set them straight. This girl owed him some money, and I said, if you owe him, give that man his money so you can go. He had them thinking I was the enforcer, and that's not true. These girls can never say I laid a hand on them. 
I had nothing to do with that. When Women Behind Bars continues. She was not only being physically beaten, punched, and kicked, uh, but she was being uh, tortured with the use of these chemicals. I see the cowboys, and that's when I see the top of her hair. I look down, and I see this Michelle wrapped in a blanket. Just after the new year in 2006, Dolly Clapp says she was working as a property manager in Buffalo, New York, for her boyfriend, Harold Bonner, also known on the streets as Damien Prophet. Police say Prophet ran a prostitution ring and had a violent reputation. Dolly claims he kept that part of his life hidden from her. I never seen that side of him, never. He was pipping these women. I didn't know anything about, I didn't know any of this. 35-year-old Michelle Hicks was one of Bonner's prostitutes. Her goddaughter, LaToya, remembers an encounter on the street that was one of the last times she saw Michelle. She was with this older man in a Bronco truck. I'm like, hi. I'm like, you OK? She was like, go, go. Like, she was scared for me to stop and talk to her. She was sitting in the passenger side. He was in the driver's seat. And it's like, she didn't say the words help, but the look on her face was help. On the evening of January 3rd, Michelle Hicks was at Bonner's house with three other prostitutes. Also at the home was Dolly Clapp. I had never seen none of these girls a day in my life until that night. Me and Mr. Bonner was in the back cleaning up, cleaning out the bedroom. He told me to get ready for bed. He had to lock them in the house. He had gates to his doors. Dolly says that Bonner drove her home just before 4 AM. When I left Mr. Bonner's house, Michelle Hicks was alive. Mr. Bonner calls me on the phone. He tells me that he catches her trying to get out of his house. Michelle tried to steal something out of Prophet's house, which were just CDs and a bottle of liquor. I said, go take it and let her go, put her out. And he called me back. And he was telling me he was torturing the girl. And I didn't believe him. Mr. Bonner called me from 10 to 4 in the morning until 6.30 that morning basically telling me what the girls, what they was doing to Michelle. I didn't, I just didn't believe it. And I said, don't be calling me with this. Police have a different view of what occurred in those early morning hours. According to witness testimony, Dolly Clapp was not hearing the torture of Michelle Hicks over the phone, but was actually at Bonner's home participating. There were a number of women present as well as Dolly May Clapp. Candy, Diamond, Millie, those were the prostitutes involved in uh, beating and strangling Michelle to death. Prophet orders them to beat her and to kick her and to stop her. Michelle was saying to Prophet, Daddy, let me give me another chance. Daddy, Daddy. Prophet asked the girls to get boots on. And the boots were stiletto boots with very sharp heels. And they were stepping on her face. But according to Dolly's own statements to police, it was Damien Prophet himself who committed the most disturbing acts of torture. He poured uh, liquid heat in her mouth. He took a douche bottle and filled it with ammonia, and he inserted it uh, in her nose. She was not only being physically beaten, punched, and kicked, uh, but she was being uh, tortured with the use of these chemicals. Dolly claimed in her statement that uh, one of the other prostitutes named Diamond had said, we can't just let her go. She'll go to the police. Diamond suggested killing her, and Dolly Clapp's response was, yeah, I guess so. She's handing them the plastic bags to put over her head. Then she gets a third bag, rips it open so they can tie it around the base of the neck to cut off the air supply. They kept going and going. Until they killed her. Until they killed her. Dolly insists she was at home on drugs while listening to the murder over the phone. I had no part of killing Michelle Hicks. I was on getting hot. My thinking was they knew him. They knew how vicious and mean they was. They put themselves in that position. Then, Dolly says, she went back to Bonner's house the next morning and heard the details of the murder from Millie, one of the prostitutes. Millie is the one who told me what happened to her. Harold Bonner then ordered Dolly and the others to clean up the house. They cleaned the floor as thoroughly as they could, and then uh, Damien Prophet sprayed oven cleaner on the floor and had them scrub that off. Prophet took a plastic trash bag and gathered the, uh, the panties that had been stuffed in Michelle Hicks's mouth the rope that she'd been bound with, some of the cleaning supplies, the rags, put it all in a trash bag, and that, that trash bag I don't believe was ever recovered. 
Michelle Hicks had been stuffed in a trash bin and put in Bonner's vehicle. Around 2 a.m. the next night, Bonner called Dolly. He says, I'm coming to pick you up so we can dump this. So him and his friend comes. Dolly claims she did not know what was in the trash bin. At that time, I didn't know that girl's body was in the garbage can in the truck. The three drove to an abandoned lot on Rapin Street. Dolly says she stayed in the truck while Bonner and the other man dumped the body out of the trash bin and covered it with cardboard. After they dropped Dolly back off at home, her phone rang. He calls me. We got to go back to get the cardboard. Prophet sent Dolly Clapp back to where they had dumped the body on Rapin Street so that she could recover that piece of cardboard because he was afraid his fingerprints were on it. I see the cardboard, and that's when I see the top of her hair. I look down, and I see this Michelle wrapped in a blanket. So I'm like, you know you didn't involve me in a murder. What happened? And that's when he went to saying that he was trying to teach her a lesson about stealing from him. He said, you know how many people I didn't kill, rolled up in rugs, and, and, and got rid of? The next day, on January 6th, the body of Michelle Hicks was discovered. She was wrapped in the blankets and uh, sheets towards the back of the, the field. Her face was exposed, and you can see that she was beaten pretty badly. Her eyes were swollen shut. The medical examiner found uh, wounds consistent with having been uh, uh, stomped with a with stiletto heel, puncture-type wounds. It's like a little square holes in her head and other parts of her body. News of Michelle's murder spread quickly through the neighborhood. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. It hit me hard, like my sister died. Police knew they were looking for someone vicious enough to torture their victim. But with few leads to go on, the case remained unsolved for two months. It was almost getting to be a cold case to a, to a point. Until investigators got a break when another terrified prostitute escaped from Harold Bonner's home. She was beaten up real bad. She was held against her will, and she had a hard time getting out of the house. And when she did, she fled from the house and across the street into a police precinct. The frightened girl told police that Bonner, a.k.a. Prophet, had brutally abused her. Prophet was on our radar. But it was another lead that would link Harold Bonner with Dolly Mae Clapp. An informant came forward from the jail. The informant was the man who helped Bonner and Clapp dispose of Michelle's body. He said she was involved in it, and she was with them when they dumped the body. And that led us to Dolly Clapp to bring her in and interview her regarding the murders. When Women Behind Bars continues, Harold Bonner and Dolly were evil people. Even in the interview, you could tell that she had an evil streak in her. That girl was alive when I left. And later, a robbery gone wrong. So Angela was like, we want to rob the Chinese man. I said, OK. In Buffalo, New York, the first murder of 2006 was 35-year-old Michelle Hicks. Investigators had two informants who pointed to a local pimp, Harold Bonner, as the killer. But they also told police about a woman named Dolly Mae Clapp, who they said was an accomplice to the murder. Police called Dolly in for questioning. In the beginning, she was telling us how, how Harold Bonner, Prophet, had called her and was explaining to her step by step on what they were doing to Michelle. It seemed to us that she knew just a little bit too much from a phone conversation. You could tell by the way she was answering that she was fudging the stories. They asked me, well, how many times did you kick the girl? I told them no, because I wasn't there. I've been trying to tell you this for the past umpteen hours. Dolly stuck to her story about hearing the murder on the phone. Detectives decided to send two colleagues in to interrogate Dolly. We told her, we, we can see. Right, we know you want to tell us something. That you're, you're not being truthful. She gave us all the details. OK, I wasn't telling the truth. I'm going to tell you the truth. Once they break, it just seems to flow. She gave us the play-by-play -play of exactly what happened in Michelle's Hicks murder. You know, what color the bags were, what color the rope was. She told us the, the color of the panties that were put in her mouth and what exactly they used to shove um, ammonia up her nose. It's one of the most graphic confessions I've heard. Dolly now claims she made up the details of her confession. I'm like, OK. I hit her one time. I just went to make it up after 14 hours, 2 o'clock in the morning. I was tired. She says her confession was also an attempt to get back at Harold Bonner because he had asked her to prostitute for him. I was trying to hurt him and get back and forth. 
you gonna make me be a prostitute? I lied. I lied. I lied. I was never there. But detectives assert that Dolly's statements were too detailed and concrete to be fiction. She described uh, how another one of the females had wrapped bags around her neck trying to strangle her and it wasn't working so they twisted it another way and who would know this unless you're there? And we went back and we asked her questions about to her response and they were exactly the same. The truth never changes. She described like some sounds that the victim made as she lay dying on that floor. She was so visual when she was talking to us saying how how Michelle was making this guttural noise, how she was starting to, was starting to shake. If you're not there, you don't know these details. After her confession, Dolly was arrested and held at the Erie County Jail. They told me uh, that my sister had been arrested for murder. I know that wasn't my sister, because she's not that kind of person. Police were now on the search for Harold Bonner, AKA Damien Prophet. Damien Prophet ended up being arrested in Boston, Massachusetts. In a bizarre twist, while investigating the murder of Michelle Hicks, police uncovered evidence of a second murder that Bonner committed. Witnesses told detectives about another prostitute, Kimberly Warren, who had worked for Bonner and was found murdered 11 years earlier in 1995. Both of the murders were committed in the presence of other prostitutes with the participation of his other prostitutes. Both of them were severely beaten. Both of them were tortured. Police were shocked to learn that Michelle Hicks, Bonner's 2006 victim, had been one of the prostitutes that helped kill Kimberly Warren, the 1995 victim. 11 and a half years before that, she had participated in the disciplining of Kimberly Warren for having run away. Harold Bonner was charged with two counts of murder and held over for trial. Prosecutors offered Clapp a plea deal in exchange for her testimony against Bonner. Oftentimes, you're making a deal with the devil, but you're choosing the lesser of two evils. They were both wicked people. My attorney tells me to plead guilty to five years. I didn't want to take five, so I said, I'm not taking for something I didn't do. I didn't kill that show. Andrew Latimpio was Dolly's defense attorney and knew the prosecution had witnesses to say Dolly was aware of the prostitution ring and was involved in Michelle's murder. These women were describing Dolly as not just the den mother. They were, they were making it sound like uh, she was Himmler over there, ordering executions and beatings, that she was the henchman for Harold Bonner. I never saw that side of her, and nor did she ever agree that that was part of her role. But that's the portrait that was going to be painted for a jury. So um, that certainly played a role in my decision to tell her to cooperate. Dolly accepted the plea deal and agreed to testify against Harold Bonner. But the district attorney's office soon discovered Clapp and Bonner were writing to each other in jail. Letters she had written reassuring him that she wasn't going to cooperate against him, telling him that she loved him. Dolly was writing letters that was proposing marriage in, in jail. Mr. Bonner wrote me. He, he said, Dolly, why would you lie on me like this? And I told him I was mad at him. I was upset with you that you was leaving me for some prostitutes. After all this years, all the money and time I put in with you, I was hurt. I said, uh, you know, Dolly, you're, you're pretty much cooking your own goose here. She not only seemed to be in love with him, but uh, uh, revering and, and, and fearful of him. Dolly's lawyer was very uh, emphatic to the judge that he feared she was still somehow under the control psychologically of Harold Bonner. It was kind of an odd mentality she had towards him. Her role seemed to be consistent with the prostitutes, somebody who was kind of brainwashed and in fear of him. The prosecutor, Frank Sedita, ultimately chose not to risk it. He convicted Bonner without Dolly's cooperation, and Dolly lost her chance for a lesser prison term. I believe he's a serial killer, and I believe he has other bodies in his past. Harold Bonner and Dolly were evil people. Even in the interview, you could tell that she had an evil streak in her, and she was a follower of him. She knew how he was. He always did have her. And then she said she didn't know how he was. Yes, Miss Clapp did. 
I think she was a lot like him. He thought they were garbage, so they were disposable. She thought that people would never look into that and it would be fine because the girls were prostitutes. The bottom of society, no one cared. I never saw any remorse in her. I was railroaded. They used me to get to him and they gave me 15 years. I guess I'll take responsibility for that driving that truck with that girl's body in it. But far as a murder, I didn't kill that girl. I didn't. Donna didn't do no wrong with that girl. She did not kill the girl. She was not there when it happened. That's my sister, Dolly, and nobody can know her the way I know her. She'd never go out of her way to hurt anybody. That is a complete injustice for her to be locked up. The wounds are still fresh for friends and family of Michelle Hicks. And they took my best friend from me. So that's a real big hole that I'm trying to, like, close up. But I don't think it'll ever be closed. The house she got killed in, I walk past it every day walking from work. Michelle, she's at peace now. It was uh, a sad irony that Michelle Hicks had participated in the murder of Kimberly Warren. I'm sure the thought uh, was always in the back of her mind that what happened to Kimberly Warren could happen to her as well. And it did. Dolly is serving her sentence at the women's prison in Bedford Hills. I talk to my kids on a regular basis. We write, we stay in touch. And my kids know I didn't kill that girl. Authorities believe having Clapp in jail takes a murderer off the streets. In my view, she was sadistic, a sadistic person, um, and she was a pathological liar. But Dolly says her only crime was not calling the authorities when she should have. So many times I wanted to call the police out, and I was scared. That's something I had to live with every day. If I wouldn't have been smoking crack, I wouldn't have been incarcerated because I would have had a better judgment. I would have did the right thing. Next up on Women Behind Bars. That's my first time ever seeing anyone that much blood in my life. Seeing someone with a bullet in them, period, and just sitting there moaning and dying. For more information about Women Behind Bars, go to www.wetv.com. On the evening of October 15, 2002, a Chinese food delivery man was accosted in the stairwell of a Brooklyn apartment building and shot to death. Mr. Lin was found on the first floor, uh, curled up in a fetal position. There was a bag of Chinese food laying on the second uh, set of steps. Police traced the call for takeout to the apartment of a 19-year-old single mom, Shaniqua Brown. That's my first time seeing that much blood. Shaniqua confessed that two male friends asked her to call in the food order, but claimed she had no idea it would lead to murder. Three people prey upon an innocent victim, and probably one of the more vicious crimes I had seen. It was Belton who did the actual robbery while Ernest Carraway stood by as a lookout. A violent, senseless act. It should have never happened. Was Shaniqua Brown an unwitting accomplice to a robbery scheme? Or did she purposely lure an innocent victim into a deadly trap? Shaniqua Brown was born in Queens, New York, and raised by a single mom. She grew up with two older siblings, Michael and Tylesha. My mom spoiled her, like, we tease her as much as we possibly can. My brother, he would say, yeah, you was adopted. We found you in a box outside. But at the end of the day, I still loved them. We were so close. When Shaniqua was 11 years old, her mother moved the family to Brooklyn, New York, in a neighborhood called Brownsville. We loved the apartment, but the gang members over there, you can easily get affiliated with them. Well, my building is at on Union and Sutter is right there in between. Blood territory and crypt territory. It's a um, pretty violent area. It has a lot of shootings. Because of the low income that's in that community. As a teenager, Shaniqua made friends easily in the neighborhood. My problem was always wanting just to fit in. Everything she did was always out of the kindness of her heart. She'd never say no to anybody. At 15 years old, Shaniqua met a fellow high school student, Damian Manley. We was going to school together. He became my best friend until 
I realized I did have a crush on him. He introduced me to marijuana. He introduced me to gang banging. He was crip. I started seeing changes in my sister when she started hanging out with him. I started smoking weed, cutting school, gang banging, and all that. But they was inseparable. That's who her group of friends was, him and whoever he knew. I tried to persuade her to stay on the right track. Anything that had to do with running the streets or doing something illegal, to me back then when I was young and dumb, it was like, it's the thing to do. I used to start fighting my sister over it. She always used to say, you're being a follower, you're being stupid. I didn't want to listen to her. At 16 years old, Shaniqua discovered she was pregnant by her boyfriend, Damien. She dropped out of school and broke the news to her mother. She was like, whatever you choose to do, I'm by your side. And I told her I'm keeping my baby. And she been there since day one. She was very happy to be pregnant. She couldn't wait to go buy the baby clothes, buy the stroller, paint the room. Shaniqua gave birth to Damien Shermaine Manley in 2000. She continued to live with her mom, who helped with the baby. Shaniqua says having a child gave her a new purpose in life. Once I had my son, I wanted to stop running the streets. She always had her son with her. They had a very close bond. But Shaniqua admits she continued living the gang life to please her friends and especially her baby's father. He beat me plenty of times. He came very controlling. One of Shaniqua's friends in the neighborhood was 22-year-old Antoine Belton. I met him through my baby father. They called him Bubba in the street. Uh, Antoine was recently released from prison in July of 2002. He was known for robbing people, just like my baby father was known for robbing people. They used to rob people together. Antoine hung out with another neighborhood boy, 16-year-old Ernest Caraway, known as Manny. Manny's a troublemaker. He would throw things off the roof at the crypts that was standing on the corner. Manny is crazy. Manny was a very angry person. He was very unpredictable. On the evening of October 15, 2002, Shaniqua was home with her sister and baby at the apartment building on Union Street. Their mom was working a night shift at her job. Shaniqua says Antoine and Manny knocked on her door around 8 p.m. I was just chilling in the hallway with Antoine, smoking, whatever, smoking weed, they was drinking, and Manny asked me to go call the Chinese restaurant. So at first I'm like, no. So Antoine was like, can you just call us the Chinese restaurant? We want to rob the Chinese man. I said, okay. The agreement between Shaniqua Brown and Antoine Belton was that the two guys would get the money and that she would get the food in exchange for making the phone call. Shaniqua went into her apartment to put in the delivery order. She just picked up the phone and dialed the Chinese restaurant like that. And she left back out. At the time that they planned this uh, robbery, Happy House was the only place that delivered. I ordered juice to the chicken with pork fried rice. Four chicken wings with french fries and strip and broccoli with pork fried rice. I told Bubba they'd be here in 15, 20 minutes. I ordered it so they can go to another apartment. And I stayed upstairs after that. 36-year-old Jian Chun Lin was working as the delivery man for the Happy House restaurant that night. He was a recent immigrant. His English, I remember, was minimal, very minimal. He had a wife that lived in China. Um, I believe he had two children also. Mr. Lin uh, left the restaurant, which is only a block and a half away. He rode his bike here, and he parked it just outside the, the apartment building here. He uh, walked into the building. Mr. Belton and Mr. Carraway were already in the hallway, so they seen Mr. Lin walk by them. He was sent to a, a phony apartment address, went to the fourth floor, knocked on the door. We didn't order find Chinese food. Mr. Lin proceeded back downstairs. When he got to the second floor landing, Mr. Belton was there waiting for him. It was Belton who possessed the gun and did the actual robbery while uh, Ernest Carraway stood by as a lookout. He ambushed Mr. Lin and pointed a gun at him and said, give it up, give it up. Mr. Lin smiled at uh, Mr. Belton, not understanding what he was saying. At the same time, he was reaching into his pocket. According to Antoine Belton, the delivery man recognized him. The victim began to say, you, 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 and he realized that the victim was someone that he had recognized. Mr. Belton then uh, fired one single shot, a strike in Mr. Lin in the stomach. Antoine Belton kept telling Ernest Carraway, grab the money, grab the money, but Mr. Carraway was so frightened about the whole thing, he just ran out of the building, and uh, Mr. Belton just followed behind him. Upstairs in their third floor apartment, Shaniqua and her sister heard the loud bang. Out of the blue is a gunshot. I'm like, oh my God, what was that? So my sister, she run out the house. When I heard that gunshot, 
it was like, I was like stuck, like, what the hell is that? And I came downstairs and I saw blood on the steps. I saw the food, I saw the menu, I saw puddles and puddles of blood, I saw footprints of blood, and then I saw him. He was holding his chest area with his knife in his hand and just like, ah. Uh, and I'm just standing there staring at him like, I cannot believe this happened. This wasn't supposed to happen. When Women Behind Bars continues. And I told him, yes, I knew about the robbery, but I didn't know nothing about no murder. She's just as responsible as the guy who pulled the trigger because she lured him there, and now this man is dead. In October 2002, 19-year-old Shaniqua Brown ordered takeout from a Chinese restaurant at the request of two friends. The three conspired to rob the delivery man. When he arrived with the food, Jian Chun Lin was ambushed by 22-year-old Antoine Belton and 16-year-old Ernest Manny Carraway in the stairwell. He was shot with a 22 caliber gun. Shaniqua heard the gunfire from her apartment and knew something had gone terribly wrong. I came downstairs and I saw his blood and I started panicking, like crying. That's my first time ever seeing anyone that much blood in my life, seeing someone with, with a bullet in them, period, and just sitting there moaning and dying. As a crowd gathered in the hallway and police sirens approached, Shaniqua ran. And I left. I went to my baby father's house crying, so I'm going to jail. I can't believe they did that. The first officers to respond were uniform officers from uh, the NYPD, the 73rd Precinct. Mr. Lynn was then found on the first floor, uh, curled up in a fetal position, uh, clutching a knife. He had been robbed one previous time. He had that knife for his protection. The gunshot perforated his aorta. When EMS arrived at the scene um, to assist him, I don't think he was speaking anymore. Paramedics rushed Mr. Lin to Brookdale Hospital, but it was too late to save him. There were a lot of homicides in that neighborhood, but when somebody is an innocent delivery man like this victim was, all the newspapers sent representatives to this crime scene. I knew right away it was a robbery gone wrong. The blood drops that we observed inside uh, the vestibule uh, started from the second floor landing uh, stairwell, and then they came down into the main lobby. Uh, it indicated that either Mr. Lin was uh, chasing his assailants or he was trying to uh, get some aid. He didn't even make it out the front door. It's a particularly dastardly crime because the victim only carries chains for 20. So how much money was really netted and what is a human life worth? The owner of Happy House and the co-workers were very upset to learn that uh, Mr. Lin had been shot. The victim was only in the United States for approximately a year. He was hoping to uh, bring his family over to uh, New York soon. Police quickly pinpointed which apartment made the phony takeout order. We were able to obtain the telephone number from Happy House Restaurant's caller ID, and we tracked that telephone number back to 2069 uh, Union Street, apartment 3 Eddie. Detectives questioned Shaniqua's sister at the apartment and then soon caught up with Shaniqua at Damien's home one block away. You could tell that she was very scared and upset about what happened and didn't realize that she was so responsible for this incident uh, at, at, at her building. When we got to the precinct, I told him, yes, I knew about the robbery. But I didn't know nothing about no murder. I didn't know nothing about no gun. Mr. Belton was flashing the gun earlier in the day to everybody, showing that he had the gun. She was aware that he had a gun. She admitted in the videotape that she knew him to carry a gun all the time. When was the last time you saw it? The gun? Mm -hmm. uh, three, four days ago. Sometimes he had it in his pocket, his pants pocket, or sometimes he had it in his jacket pocket. When he showed his gun, he was like, I always had this on me, baby. After Shaniqua confessed to her part in the crime, she was charged with murder and held at Rikers Island. She thought that after they know the truth, they will let her go because she knows she didn't actually pull the trigger. I didn't know I was getting charged with murder in the first degree. I kept thinking I was my son. I, I can't go home to my son. The next day, police apprehended Ernest Carraway, who had acted as the lookout. Two days later, they cornered Antoine Belton, the shooter, at his aunt's apartment. The murder weapon had been tossed out the window of her apartment, but police recovered it and matched ballistics to the bullet that killed Mr. Lin. Antoine knew he was caught and he cooperated with us fully. He also seemed um, 
very concerned to take the blame off of Shaniqua. She didn't know what we was going to do or nothing. You know, um, that's why I don't know why y'all holding her. She don't know nothing. Antoine was remorseful. He was sorry for his actions. It was a scared shot. I, I ain't mean to do it. I was going to turn myself in. I ain't, I, ain't, I ain't mean to do that to that man. This case was solved very quickly. The detectives had done a pretty phenomenal job, so I considered it, with regards to each of those defendants, a pretty airtight uh, case for the prosecution. Shaniqua remained at Rikers Island pending trial. While there, she learned she was pregnant with her second child. She found out she was having Destiny, her daughter, after she got incarcerated. So Destiny was born there in prison. On November 6, 2003, Shaniqua Brown pled guilty to second-degree murder. The judge sentenced her to 15 years to life in prison. She'll be eligible for parole in 2017. I believe my, my actions deserve some punishment, but not 15 years to life. Just making that phone call made her very culpable. She conspired with two others to, um, to participate in a robbery. One phone call can turn tragically wrong in a split second. And I think that's what happened with Fishaniqua. Maybe she did know that he was going to take a bullet, maybe she didn't. But the bottom line is, is the guy did take a bullet. And she's just as responsible as the guy who pulled the trigger. People do things like this all the time for $13 worth of food. I don't think you ever get used to, to the senselessness of some of the crimes that occur. I don't think you ever do. Shaniqua was allowed to raise her daughter for eight months in the prison nursery before an altercation with another inmate forced her to turn her baby over to her mother to raise. I stood there and cried until it was time for me to pass my baby to my mother. I was devastated. Six years into her sentence, Shaniqua harbors many regrets about her actions that got her here. I regret dropping out of school. I regret living the gang life. I regret saying yes when I should have said no. I regret not listening to my mother all these years. The only thing I don't regret is having my kids. Shaniqua makes the best of her time while incarcerated by filling her days with school and work programs. But it is the time with her kids that she lives for. That's the beautiful part of it all, even though we'd rather her here. She writes them letters every chance she gets. They go on trailer visits up there to see her. They barbecue. They do all kinds of arts and crafts together. It's very hard when they come on a visit and they see that I can't walk out with them. But now my son's at the age where, Mommy, why are you here? Mommy, what did you do? Why you can't come home with me? He's a constant reminder of her. And I wish she had that same opportunity I have to raise her child like I'm raising mine. We could have been doing it together. You know, I miss that. I miss a whole lot of stuff about my sister. I think it was extremely important for um, each of them to take responsibility for what they had done. For them and also for honestly, our community. While someone might look at it and go, wow, she only made the phone call, when you look at it in the big picture, it was a domino effect and a series of events happened that would never have happened but for her. You can never bring back Mr. Lynn. I can't ever make his family whole again. You always hear people coming to America to have the American dream, and it just seems so incredibly tragic that this is the experience that ended his life. My heart does go out to his family, and if they don't forgive me now, I hope they would one day down the line. Because at the end of the day, I'm, I have to live with that too. And it's killing me every day. Just, I just want them to know that I was only 19 and young and dumb. I am not that person anymore. I'm totally different.